before we get uh, to Josh, let me bring up uh, Mike McGinn from the Next Generation IT Club. Um, this is the club that sponsors the pizza after the event. So uh, I think that in itself deserves a round of applause. <laughs> going to tell you about the club, what the club is working on currently, and uh, how you might want to get involved. Well, I see a lot of new faces. Thanks for coming over and uh, checking us out. This uh, is a great speaker series. And um, the Next Generation IT Club is the campus club for folks that are interested in information technology, web design, robotics, um, and anything related to that. Uh, from 11 to 1 p.m. over in CC3234. So you're all welcome to join. Um, your membership has already been paid in the club because you're students. So you're, you're wasting resources if you don't take advantage of it. <laughs> uh, a couple of events we have coming up are the uh, Spring Tech Fair on um, May 18th. Um, yeah, we'll be having that after the uh, Speaker Series that Friday from 1 to 5. We'll have a few more speakers, and we'll have a, a buffet of snacks. We'll have some uh, technical training examples here of the various things that the BIT program is teaching. We'll have a student slideshow of projects that have been completed. So all students are invited to submit a, a screenshot or a uh, slideshow presentation of, of any project that they've completed. So especially some of your projects that do a, a uh, PowerPoint. We'll put that into a, a rotating PowerPoint that will be going along through the event. And then uh, Linux Fest is coming up uh, May, <coughs> April 27th, 28th, and 29th. And we'll be going to Bellingham. We have uh, uh, 15 seats available in the van. Uh, we've got eight filled so far. So if you want to go with us, let us know um, quickly. But if we have more people interested in going, then we have seats available. We'll be holding a lottery to see who gets to go. Um, your hotel, food, and transportation back and forth to Bellingham will be paid if you are, are, are a winner of the lottery. You can see the vehicle that you want. Uh, with that, um, you can visit our website at tngitc.com and get links to all of our projects that we're working on. Thank you. Now I'll turn it back over to Brian to introduce our speaker. All right. And, um, Josh McDonald's is our speaker, and uh, Rebecca's going to come up and, and introduce him. Um, have you all met, met Rebecca Cooper, uh, our internship coordinator here? If you haven't met her, do, because she's a great resource um, that can really help in that transition from the coursework that you're doing, the studying that you're doing, to that job placement um, via the internship. Well, I have the distinct honor today to introduce Josh McDonald, but he's our first TSP speaker in the speaker series, so you're a pioneer. <laughs> so, the pressure, yeah, exactly. So uh, Josh's background includes getting his undergraduate degree in architecture from WSU, and then he went on to get his master's in architecture at WSU. He's worked in the profession for seven years here in Seattle at two different firms. The first six were spent at T Tiscarino. Yeah. Associates. It's a small architecture firm that specializes in master planning, mixed use. Most recently, he moved to Weber Thompson, where he's currently working on mixed use residential buildings. Josh is also involved in ACE, or ACE, which is a mentorship program for high schoolers who are interested in architecture, engineering, and construction. So let's welcome Josh.
good six years and put in some good time there. Um, learned a lot, and had, you know, uh, had some good experience doing some internships with uh, some firms back in Olympia, which is fun. But, um, you know, I had, you know, my first six years had a great opportunity to work for a really small firm. There were two to three people um, when I first started. We grew to about seven people. Um, and, and one of the benefits and one of the reasons why I looked to work for a small firm is I knew I was going to get that jump into, you know, project manager role, or leadership role um, in design process. So, uh, you know, this, this project here is, is an example of a project that worked on in um, West Oregon, or East Oregon rather, in uh, Prairie City, in the middle of nowhere, but it's a, a ranger district station. Um, and then this is another project uh, in Seattle. Uh, which is a mixed-use project ended up on top of Queen Anne. And, you know, both of these projects were, um, I think that it was unique for um, somebody to put, somebody like myself in that role coming out of school not knowing hardly anything and then saying, okay, here's a design, go. And uh, that, there's a big learning curve and so uh, that, that was a really good opportunity for me to go from a small firm to take what I learned to move on into uh, working for Weber Thompson. So this is uh, this is actually the, the building where I, where Weber Thompson resides. Uh, we're in South Lake Union. Um, we are a multidisciplinary architecture firm. We do architecture, landscape, master planning, um, interior design. And we are right in South Lake Union, right amongst uh, all the Amazon growth and everything. It, it's insane right now. All the construction is happening. Uh, it's, it's really neat to see, and especially the, the light rail to go from, or street call rail, rather, to go from nothing, hardly any use to actually. I mean, it's packed. It's packed every day, which is really cool to see. Um, so, you know, moving to Weber Thompson was, was a great, great thing. Um, they started. You know, in Seattle, and went from basically a 40-person firm, and then during the heyday, up to 100 people, and then during the downturn, back down to 25. So, um, and that and that happened a lot, uh, all throughout the all throughout the architecture, structural, like you know, the entire uh, development community. So now we're extremely lucky in that uh, we're basically focusing on apartment mixed use projects and that's what a lot of what's being built right now. Uh, you go anywhere in Seattle with some cranes and none of them are condos, they're all apartments. And uh, the reason for that is that people are getting foreclosed on, they have terrible credits, so they can buy a house, so they're moving into apartments. Or in the instance of Amazon, like what we were talking about earlier, that there's so many people moving to an area that there's a need to move So um, I wanted, you know, so that's kind of a background of, of you know, myself and, and Weber Thompson, and I think to kind of tie it to what you guys are learning, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about energy codes and and how the architecture community interacts with those, to, with consultants to meet the codes, and um, I'll use an example of a project. I'm currently working on. Um, it's in Redmond. It's a Type 5, which Type 5 construction is wood frame. Uh, so it's five floors of Type 5 wood frame construction over one level of Type 1, which is concrete construction. And basically the, the first floor is the retail non-residential use and the five floors of So what, what we'll do is actually work through and figure out all our floor plans. Um, you know, we've got a program from a developer or a client, and they want X amount of retail. Uh, they want so many units, and they've got you know a diversity of mixes. So they want so many two bedrooms, so many one bedrooms, so many students. So we figure out our building envelope, massing, and start to you know plug in, do unit layouts, do the retail layouts, and then. 
basically we get to what I would call 50% that's design development. And at that point, you know, we've, we've worked, you know, heads down architecture um, only, trying to figure out how everything works. And then at this point, at 50 to 60%, it's, all right, we need to talk to our consultants and start to figure out how we can make this building work, not only from a code standpoint, um, but also from, you know, uh, all the mechanical systems, placement of transformers, electrical rooms, and all that kind of stuff. So for Energy Code, what we'll do is we actually will send all of our drawings that we've done today. And we have different Energy Code consultants that we work with. Uh, Patrick Hayes is one that lives up in the local area that's really well known. Um, he's actually written some of the codes. And then there's you know people like Rushing, Cezanne. These are big, big organizations that do energy, electrical. So, We'll send them our drawings, they'll basically take our drawings and start to say, all right, you've got this much square foot of retail, you have this much glazing in your retail, this much square foot in your residential, this much glazing in your residential, and they basically start to generate a model. They'll actually build a model um, from our AutoCAD and figure out where where we need to put different walls. So in the upper floors, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, it's all wood frame. So how do we insulate our walls enough to meet the energy code? And similar down in the retail level, if we've got a concrete wall, you know, you can't just have a concrete wall with cold side and, a, and warm side. You need to have some kind of insulation. And so we'll go through and, and actually look at it different floor assemblies and wall assemblies and to make sure that when he's when they're making that building model that we're meeting the energy code. So this this project that I'm working on is in Redmond. So it's a Washington State Energy Code. And um, Washington State Energy Code is you know quite a bit more strict than a lot of the other state jurisdictions. Um, which is a good thing. But um, so we, we'll go through and, and look at different wall assemblies and floor assemblies and figure out, okay, we can't put insulation here. So let's, I guess if I go back, so here's a great example. So I've got a ramp that's coming up here. And I can do, I can do so much, you know, R28 insulation, which is a thicker insulation at one point. But as you come up the ramp, you have limited head height here. So you actually need to have a thinner insulation. So you've got an R28 at this location and an R28 at that location. So what's the difference? It's it's a thinner profile insulation and it's more expensive. So, but it's necessary so that we can cars can be things. So that seems like kind of mundane stuff, but all that stuff, there's different trade-offs that we work with our energy code consultant to make sure that we're um, I guess another, you know, so here, this is a, a concrete or CMU wall, or basically at a, at a stair, and we're having to add some rigid insulation in here, because the garage is essentially a cold space, the stair is a, you know, a heated space, so we need to add this so that we can get enough points to meet our energy code. So, in terms of how architects work with energy code consultants, um, that, that's essentially how it works. There's a lot of back and forth. They generate a building model based on our AutoCAD. And, and then we start to figure out, OK, we need to add a thicker wall here because the insulation is going to fit for us. So um, there's, there's a couple. There's, Basically, five different um, five different tiers for the energy code. So there's there's essentially the, the baseline building, which is the industry standard. Um, that would be um, any building that's constructed now has to meet you know a state energy code. <coughs> and then there's the Seattle Energy Code, which is on the, you know the next step down. 
Then we have the 2030 challenge, which is essentially each five years, they're slowly trying to get to a uh, net zero building, basically. This is building, building challenge, uh, which is essentially a building that uh, can basically sustain itself off the grid. And then there's a net positive building. And essentially that is a building that not only is off the grid, but it can tap into the grid to give energy back to the grid. And actually, um, I've heard instances where people you know, are making money or getting credits towards um, you know, their utilities or whatever it may be. So how does, you know, so based on those five tiers, we can just kind of go through the five tiers. And, and we'll start, you know, let's just call this a baseline industry standard building. And um, basically, CVEX, uh, CE, it's a commercial building energy consumption survey. We'll go around the United States and survey uh, these industry standard buildings to see, you know, how how are they doing for energy consumption? Um, you know, what type of mechanical systems are they using? What type of windows do they have? It, you know, all of that is starting to impact uh, you know, lots of. So CBEX will go through every three to five years, depending on the funding, of course. The last one, I think, was 2007. So they're going to do one next year. But essentially, this is, this is once they go around and do the, the stand for these surveys, that kind of sets the bar for the industry standard. So the next, I guess, I should step back. On top of that, um, see how AIA is doing something. AIA is the Architectural Association. Um, and they're actually going through and doing surveys of buildings, surveys of architects to see what types of buildings they're developing. So are they doing the buildings? Are they doing, you know, uh, are they just meeting the industry standard? Um, you know, and, and how how that's impacted by the owner. So uh, CLAIA is, is actually moving forward and trying to figure that out as well, which is, which is helpful. Um, so then going from the building, the industry standard, down to the Seattle Energy Code. Uh, Seattle Energy Code is, um, it's funny, I, you know, we were just meeting with a contractor yesterday on this, on this project that I'm working on. And they have, they have continually have a lot of questions and their jaw drops because of the amount of insulation that goes into the project type of windows that we're having to use um, and, and the materials because it's it's adding a considerable cost to their construction. And what's happening is the owner is saying, well, hey, why is why is my project so expensive for you know when you're bidding it? I need you to cut a lot of money on this. And so the contractor's coming to us and saying, well what the heck, why do we have this much much insulation? Why do we need why do we need insulation between a stair and a garage? It doesn't seem like that's really worthwhile. And the answer is our energy code consultant has gone through, has generated a building model, and we're you know right on the cusp of meeting it. I mean we're talking about bumping the windows up by you know, 0.01 for our rating, just for U rating, just so that we can meet the code. And so we literally can't so that's kind of what's spurring this industry standard to, to slowly bump up. And it's, it's a change in the cost for uh, developers. But, they, but the return, because of the energy code, is, is forward. So Seattle Energy Code is, is, is a next step down from the industry standard or the, or the state energy code. And they're, they're, pretty, uh, they're pretty strict. So even in between the city of Redmond and the city of Seattle, it's, there's, there's a big difference. Um, City of Seattle has three different ways they has three different ways that they look at it. Um, there's a prescriptive option uh, component, and then an annual energy analysis. And essentially, the component is, is what 90% of people that are submitting for permit use. Uh, the fun method, basically, because we have this mismatch of floor assemblies, wall assemblies. They actually have to take all these different things and pull them together. 
together and calculate it out. Yeah. Is that <coughs> also like a trade off? Like, you can't do this to this, so make this one really, really good. Cool. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And, and you know, a, another great example of this, this building that I'm working on, we have one area where we've got a retail space, and it's a concrete deck above with the residential. And the decks for those apartments sit right on the sit right on the deck of the retail space. So what the energy code is saying is, okay, we basically got an exterior deck space from the apartment level, which is concrete, down into the retail level. So there is coal that's bridging the concrete into this warm space. So we're actually just adding insulation in an area, in one area where these decks are over the retail space to meet the requirement. I mean, it seems really silly. And a lot of these things, you look at it and it just kind of doesn't quite make sense. And that's, that's one thing that's changing. Um, another great example is um, where we've got you know, a concrete wall and we need to put insulation in there, basically, We'll use a metal stud to fur out the wall and to put the insulation in there. Well, the metal stud actually bridges the coal from the concrete into the warm space. So then the code is actually changing to make that more difficult. So you'll have to use a, 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 wood, a wood stud as opposed to uh, steel. Yeah. Um, you were talking a few minutes ago about the glazing and maybe adjusting the U factor. Is your firm doing anything to actually encourage people to reduce the size of the glazing, since that is the majority of your loss in space per day? It, my first answer is no. Okay. Um, I guess an example um, is, you know, in an apartment you want as much light as you can get, and these apartments are so deep now. Um, some apartments that I'm looking at right now it's all open one bedrooms. So basically they're it's like a studio except they're really long and they have a, a cubby hole for a bed, basically, that's back in And so, you know, when you've got a 38 foot deep unit, you really need 